Hey everybody, welcome to the GMG Review. Today we're taking a look at the Catacombs of Kurali, solo and cooperative adventure for Relic Blade, the adventure battle game. Um, now this was written by Malev and Sean Sutter uh, and is a full sort of like expansion for the game to play procedurally generated dungeon adventures with a special crew of heroes and villains who are trapped basically in a, a giant crack in the earth. So no matter what your Relic Blade collection is, the bad guys are a set of models um, that you can get. It's the... Um, Augusul is the name of this like clan warriors and their their background and history is actually uh, put up in here as well. And this sort of like um, location, which is the Catacombs of Corral, uh, you're in the middle of a conflict and you're collapsed through a crack in the earth into this underground sort of like fortress and series of tunnels and stuff. And you have to try and get yourself free. Uh, so it's cool because it, it allows you to use your existing Relic Blade collection. Um, it gives you a host of like sort of narratively driven bad guys, at, which can also be used as a faction in like the core Relic Blade sort of like two player experience. And then you can play either by yourself or cooperatively with a friend with your own little drafted heroes, uh, collect magic items. And it really leans into this great card system that Relic Blade has. Right, for your um, enhancements and abilities uh, to do like a leveling up and experience progression system as well. So it's sort of like a dungeon version of the Seekers campaign, uh, which is the great campaign system for playing head to head in uh, Relic Blade, and is a great way of introducing the game to. If you play cooperatively, then you're playing against like the AI generated bad guys. Um, and I'm planning on playing this with Cash and Katina because this is a great way to like introduce them like a dungeon adventure without having to do too much. Um, of them having to like do prep work and it'll be different every time we play it. So let's dive in. This is a, how many pages? 60 page um, rule book where you have uh, the core background. I love when Sean draws himself in this doc. It's adorable. <laughs> I love that so much. Uh, and um, it's fully illustrated in full cover. It's um, uh, stable bound. So it's a nice like easy add on to your Relic Blade book collection and it won't get too damaged by referencing it because it's not, it doesn't have a hard spine. It's got a, um, uh, whatchamacallit, a stapled spine. Uh, and it's lovingly in, like um, illustrated by Sean himself and then a lot of the miniature painting and photography is done by Malev. So you can see these beautiful catacombs and miniatures they painted up um, for the actual like uh, interior photography and stuff as well. Very inspirational. Um, so let's dive in and talk a little bit about the background and then about the core mechanics of the game and the things I think are interesting about it. So talking about the Lost Champions of Corral, you can see here it is a mix of adversary and advocate. So if you don't know anything about Relic Blade, um, the good guys are called the advocates, the bad guys are called the adversaries. Uh, and the idea here is that you're in the middle of fighting and you get dumped into this underground um, uh, like labyrinth basically and you have to band together to get out. So it's kind of Warhammer questy in that you're going to have four controllable characters and you're going to build a deck of who they could be and you won't know when you dive in. So it means you can't really min-max it. It's a clever game design mechanic because it means that you're not able to sort of like optimize your force. You also build a deck of um, enhancements. And I'm gonna deal out my initial let's play version from having already like put those together. Uh, we get background for the Scholars of Moldorf, which are the, um, the uh, Dwarven Society basically who are like explorers and, uh, and, and I guess like delvers. The Warriors of Akkad, these really cool sort of like goblins uh, that Sean came up with who are sort of like martial heroes, which I think is really cool. And then the Lords of the Swarm, which is the demonic bug people, like, like sort of like wizardy bug people. And then finally the Magisters who are the gnomes, wizardy gnomes. Uh, and then background on the Eye of the Storm and the, um, the Agsul Warhost, who are these like sort of strangely degenerate trolls that Augurath, his evil god, is uh, manipulating and creates like seers to like do his will. Um, and it's it's a bit like uh, evil sort of like overmind. It's a bit like sauron in Sean's universe. And I really like that because it gives this like uh, sort of like bad guy race that's infesting the labyrinth that you have to deal with to try and escape. So you have a collection of models and it's basically covered by the clan box set. Uh, with a couple of additional heroes, which is the Clan Seer and the uh, the Warlord actually comes in the box set. So if you just buy the um, Augsul like uh, starter set, the, the the miniature collection, you have all the models you need for the campaign. As long as you don't want to be using the um, the Clan Seer because that's an additional pack, but you get the Augurath Gorgon and the Clan Seer, and then you have the full range of miniatures for playing through it. But if you just decide you're going to use as your boss encounter the um, Clan Chieftain, then you can just get the starter set as well to play through. So these are the models you need to have the full experience. It's a clan chieftain, an iron wrecker, uh, two lizard hands, and two clan warriors are what come in the starter set. 
And the Agroth Gorgon's like the big monster, basically. It's the weird, like, magic y f- eye monster. Um, the Eyes of Orgoroth and the Clan Seer are the additional ones. They come in the same pack, and they're her little, like, summonable, like, minions that she, uh, she fights through. All right, so solo and co-op gameplay. Uh, solo wargaming may feel a bit odd at first. In reality, there's nothing terribly unusual about playing a single-player game. Uh, if it was a video game, you would think nothing of it, and doing that for Relic Blade uh, is just as easy and fun and sort of, like... Um, uh, rewarding. Uh, playing cooperatively, equally fun because you don't have to ha- have a winner and a loser. It's both you competing against the game. Uh, and then what do you want for your components for actually playing? Well, you want some objectives uh, for these sort of like bespoke item areas uh, on the table. You want some dungeon terrain and you want that collection of energy miniatures I just, or enemy miniatures I just went over. Uh, there's a new order phase. Just your characters go, your enemies go, and you recover. Um, and making your activation rolls and doing things is covered as well. Uh, so, during the character phase, player characters are activated one at a time until all the characters have been activated. Players must cooperatively decide which character will activate next, based on the tactical situation, rather than any kind of strict turn order. Instead of rolling for initiative as you would in a normal game Relic Blade, characters perform an activation roll to check their personal initiative against the surrounding enemies and environmental dangers. When a character is chosen to activate, the controlling player must roll a dice and resolve the resulting ef- event from the activation chart before activating the character. This activation roll represents both the treacherous dangers of the environment and the perilous balance of the initiative in combat. In Dark Dungeons, dungeons, safety is never guaranteed. So there's a random element to activation, which is kind of cool because it means that you don't have like the ability to kind of game the system, and you never know quite what your hero is capable of when you go to activate it. So you're going to roll. Uh, one's the worst result as a result of the character's, the champion's misstep or the enemy's dark will. Terrible monsters seize the initiative. This results often um, with new threats emerging from the shadows as monsters search to attack. This is the most dangerous result. Um, a two is a bad result. It only takes a momentary lapse of focus for evil um, it's creatures to exploit the opening and strike. This result usually involves a quick and dangerous strike from a random monster, and then a three to four is a contextual result. Uh, contextual results relate directly to the scenario. These result in um, dangerous traps, arcane mechanisms grinding to life, or simply the uh, adventurer's fumbling effort to overcome the environment. And then five plus is a good result. The adventurer stands ready to face the present, and their ideal result uh, allows the character to activate as normal. Now these are um, basically your, 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 your possible results. Uh, the activation chart re-roll is a cautious advance. Activation chart re- um, results can be very punishing. So characters may exert themselves to avoid catastrophe. Characters may spend their focus action to re-roll the activation dice. The re-roll result is resolved when the character activates with minus one action dice and cannot focus again during uh, an activation. So fo- focusing at the end of your action gives the ability to try and get that five plus. Um, and then group activations and triggered actions. When uh, executing, executing a group activation, make a single roll on the activation chart. If the result uh, event targets the activated character, randomize. When activating the character targeted, and after resolving the event, proceed as normal. So basically, uh, there's going to be a bunch of like chances that something bad happens. Now during the enemy phase, during the enemy phase, all enemies are activated one at a time and in any order chosen by the players. Some of the enemies on the table may perform actions during the character phase, but during the enemy phase, they perform all their full activation. So if you trigger bad guy actions during the character phase, you don't get to um, uh, like reduce their action pool and stuff like that. All right, uh, so then the recovery phase, making recovery rolls. Now, it's cool that the monsters don't actually uh, target downed characters. They only target characters in a certain order. Um, they will, uh, sorry, enemy behavior. I just skipped a page. Uh, determine the target. You either, enemies will always target the closest character, unless stated otherwise. Use the following priority if there's multiple potential targets. Either the most dodge tokens, the least remaining health, and then finally randomized, and they never target disabled models. Uh, enemies will always move via the shortest route possible directly towards their target. Enemies must avoid dangerous routes whenever possible. If enemy movement engages a character other than the original target, they'll switch to a new character. If an enemy is required to jump, disengage, or break a bind, they always focus on the action if they have enough action dice. And then enemies will only dodge or disengage when instructed by results in the uh, activation chart or scenario rules. If enemies have dodge tokens, they use them to defend at the first chance they get, unless the, uh, they automatically block all the damage. If move result is a charge, they will immediately perform an attack action. And then enemy attacks melee, uh, they must use the attack with the highest damage bonus, and they must focus if they have enough AD. If attacks um, have equal damage bonuses, the enemy will use the attack with the lowest difficulty. And then ranged, when enemies with ranged weapons are triggered to charge, they focus shoot instead. If their target is out of range or line of sight, they have follow the rules for movement. Uh, and then all combat falls the normal procedure for activation, and engagement, and disengagement. Uh, and then dread sentience. When activating an enemy monster, resolving dangerous events, or at any point during gameplay, an event resolution doesn't make sense or feels uh, thematically nonsensical, consider the dread sentience rule. 
in order to resolve this dispute, the worst case scenario always unfolds. So always the worst thing possible will happen. So when you're making your activation rolls, every scenario is going to have um, a number of activation charts, and the activation chart will show what happens. All right, so you're going to roll on the activation and see what happens. Um, so now, th the chart I showed previously isn't the actual chart that you use. You use the chart inside the scenario. So there'll be different like triggers for events. And on a five plus, you always get to do what you want. But on ones, twos, threes, and fours, different things can happen based on like what's going on during the, sh the showdown. Uh, and then recovery phase, like I said, players make recovery rolls for all disabled characters in the table. And this includes not only player characters, but also enemies. Players roll dice, and on a six, the character recovers one health and may activate as normal during the following round. Keep in mind that enemies and monsters that will be critically injured um, from recovering will minus, usually have minus one to their um, action dice. After character fails recovery roll, they immediately move two inches in any direction because you can crawl. And when the scenario ends, if any characters have escaped, uh, then any disabled characters within two of the exit also escape. So even if you're down during a scenario, you can crawl towards the door basically and try and get out. And then you get non-heroic recovery. So if you enlist a hero that doesn't get heroic recovery, um, they're not removed from play if they fail a recovery roll. Instead, they will heroically endure until they make a successful recovery roll or some other event removes them from play. So you don't actually um, lose them automatically like you would in a normal game of Relic Blade. Uh, and then enemy characters still suffer from non-heroic recovery, which means they will go away. So enemy characters that don't have heroic recovery will, will still die. Um, and then heroic resolve, when a player a character successfully recovers during the recovery phase, they may skip rolling on the activation chart. And instead, activate as normal during the next round. Mark them with a buff token as a reminder. So basically, if you recover during a, a turn, you automatically don't trigger an event next turn because you're using like your last gasp. All right, terrain. Now, I'm using the very cool um, MDF terrain from Schooner Labs, but you can also make your own terrain. Uh, what you need to play is basically going to be rearranged every scenario to create a new dungeon. So you need a large room that's 8x8 eight eight and 2 inches tall, two small rooms that are 4x4 four four and 2 inches tall, one long room that's 4x8 and 2 inches tall, one long bridge that's 8x2 two, and two short bridges that are 4x2, a long platform that's 8x3 uh, and 1 inch tall, and two short platforms that are 4x3 and 1 inch tall. Now the MDF train that uh, Schooner Labs makes is basically all broken down into the smallest version of all these components. So you're going to get four of these, uh, eight of these, and they can all be lined up to make it however you want. And then you also get your platforms and stuff, uh, as well as some doors. But the little scattered stuff for train is up to you. Uh, you need a door to mark the exit, three brazier objectives, a potion, herb ring, and brouch treasure marker, two trap markers, and plenty of different debris like stones, wooden crates, and other decorative items. Uh, and then it defines rooms and bridges and platforms and dungeon debris for like terrain purposes. Beautiful terrain made by Malev, and you can see he's got his like big rooms and stuff all lined up and, and got like edging and stuff on them so that you can make them pretty on the sides. Uh, and then the campaign system. So um, the Catacombs Crowd, you're trying to make a character deck to start off with. So you want four advocate characters. Here's my character deck right here. Four advocate characters, four adversary characters, and any additional characters you want. So I'm using the minimum. So I used a bounty hunter, a uh, hellhound berserker. I want to do like the classic good guys. So we've got the bounty hunter as a shooter. The hellhound berserker is a uh, dwarf. Uh, the flame bear is my wizard. And then I used my own legendary character, Braun Bear Killer, who's a variation of a lone guard. Um, as my adversary, or my advocate, sorry. And my adversaries, I mixed in a destroyer pig, a shark warrior, an ogre redieris, and an iguan marauder as my bad guy heroes. So then we shuffle them up, and the four that I draw will be the characters that I get for this campaign. I'm going to close my eyes because I used sleeves that weren't entirely like <laughs> trans, um, uh, opaque. So I'll cut the deck, and then I'll count out one, two, three, four. So let's see who I got. Four. All right, I got the Hellhound Berserker, the Bounty Hunter, the Iguan Mar uh, Marauder, and an Ogre Ready Air. So I got half adversaries and half um, advocates. I didn't get Brawn, though, my legendary character, so I'm pissed. Um, then I need to make a uh, upgrade deck, and it's three character-specific upgrades, three universal upgrades, and any additional upgrades. So you're always going to have um, at, le like, at least six cards in the deck. I put eight in. So keyword ones would be like, I have one, two, three, four um, character ones. I have a Fighter, Fighter Knight a Witcher Wizard, and a Wizard. So Arcane Protection, Elemental Smite, Combat Superiority, and Heavy Armor. And then for the Universal ones, I went with a Magic Weapon, because obviously Inner Mastery, a Magic Lantern, and Optimized Armor. And these will get shuffled up, and as I go through the campaign, these will be the things I can find um, and craft your upgrade deck. Uh, when players are rewarded from an upgrade deck uh, between scenarios, players randomly draw a card and decide amongst themselves which character will come up the upgrade. So my four characters will be able to use that upgrade deck. Uh, and then the encounter deck. So the encounter deck is actually 
um, what encounter you're doing and what's in that room when you have it. And these are uh, from the Catacombs of Corral like card set, the 10 card set, plus all my own cards. So the Blade Oil, the Corrosive Vial, and the Gauntlets of Strength are from my own card collection. And then the other three are new and come in here, the Noxious Bomb, um, and then the Magic Lantern and the Quicksilver Bangles. So whenever you play the campaign, you always play the first mission, which is where you're like dumped in after the fall. And then you're gonna randomly flip a card. So in this case, the health potion means I would play Magic Lantern, Blade Oil, Gun Strength. Oh, there's no health potion here, what am I doing? Oh no, these are separate. I need to find the Noxious Bomb. Oh, I grabbed the wrong ones. <laughs> so you would flip, so let's say I flip the Corrosive Vial. We would play scenario number five, and this would be the item that would be in there. So the upgrade is not always awarded to the party, so be sure to follow the scenario setup. So we might not get it at the end of the mission, but it's an additional upgrade that you might get it on top of what's on the upgrade deck. Uh, the campaign will always start with the prologue, followed by three encounters, and the players must successfully complete the third encounter before with the final showdown. So when you get to your third room after the um, or your third encounter after the like uh, the the one where you arrive, basically the arrival thing, you're gonna add the boss encounter to that third encounter. So you'll get whatever. There's basically six possible encounters plus the arrival encounter, so seven encounters. And every time you play through the campaign, you play four missions. So that's what our campaign will be: it'll be four missions, um, randomly determined by the encounter deck, which is also your prize, basically, and means that the encounters are all themed around what's in that room. Uh, and you add the boss to the end. Uh, so I'm not gonna go too far into the, but I'll talk about the final showdown. Uh, you can rest in between rounds and stuff like that. So there are like healing things and finding common treasures and stuff. Uh, the common treasures are what's inside um, barrels and things every now and again. That's what those cards were. The health potion, healing, or magic ring and raven brooch, those four are inside there. And they can be found with these tokens. Uh, you might abandon characters if you leave them too far from the door when the scenario ends. Uh, you can rest forage uh, to try and find a uh, magic item. And then you can also meditate in between. So between each scenario, you can do one of those three things. You can either tend your wounds, recover two health, um, forage, roll a d6 and claim a random treasure. So like a noxious bomb, a curse of vial, a healing herb, a magic potion, or a magic ring. And then meditate with restore uses on all spells and tactics. So in between the, the rooms, you don't get back... Um, your like one use, two use, three use only items. So like for instance, uh, one of the spells in here that the flame bearer can get is Elemental Smite. It's only two uses. So if he doesn't meditate, he won't get that back, right? He'll need to meditate to, to get that use back basically in between the, the rooms and scenarios. Uh, and there's no other bookkeeping except the cards, which I think is great. You don't have to use like a big um, like character sheet because you're just keeping track of it like a board game. Uh, and then that's it. So the first mission is crash down collaborators. As the storms of Corral reach their violent climax, the catacombs far below shuddered with fierce anticipation. The mountain heaved as rival champions clambered and clashed in the ruins of ancient temples. And as the fateful moment the slopes of the rivals exploded and the floor gave way beneath them in the furious maelstrom of stone and st storm, and storm, the lost champions plunge into the deadly depths. So basically they become unlikely allies and this is the first mission that crashes you down. Um, and then finally, you have your boss encounters for the clan chief and the clan seer. Uh, and they are like your big boss fights, and then I'm not gonna get the epilogue ruined basically, but that's it. So kind of like a, v this is kind of like a, uh, an encapsulated experience for Relic Blade, where you get to play through sort of like a narratively driven event with a specific group of models, uh, and I'm pretty pumped for it. So I'm gonna play through four missions. Uh, you'll see those with the Let's Play pretty soon. We do the Crash Down, the Emergence, uh, and they'll be coming up um, in the next couple weeks on a Monday. So big thanks for watching. Uh, I'm really excited for this, and I think if you're looking for a fun narrative way of playing Relic Blade, especially if you want to teach it, uh, or like teach it to younger players or people that don't war game very often, and you have a cool collection. I think this is a, a great expansion for Sean's game, and I'm excited that Malev has um, dipped his toes into writing with this as well. He's got his new project, Demon Ship, that's coming out. I think it's on pre-order right now as well um, from Black Side Studio, so check that out, because this is his first thing he made, and then Demon Ship's his first full standalone game. Uh, so here it is. Hey, thanks for watching. Thanks, Alan Ash. Hey there, I hope you enjoyed that video. There are tons of other games already recorded for you to watch. Click over to my channel page if you haven't already and have a look to the dozens of playlists full of videos. I guarantee you'll discover a game you haven't seen played before. I put out new videos seven days a week and every day is themed to a different genre as I continue to explore the wider world of gaming. Of course, none of that's possible without you, the viewer, so click a like and subscribe if you'd like to stay on top of what's happening here daily. 
My two kids and I are massively grateful to be able to have the flexibility of this job so I can always maximize my time with them. If you want to support me continuing to put out this content, it's only possible because of my amazing backers on Patreon who support the studio, equipment, and model costs, as well as being how I make the bulk of my living. You can also help out by buying a t-shirt through Spreadshirt, a measuring gauge or widget from Death Ray Designs, or buying one of my games and supplements like Last Days, Gamma Wolves, and Blaster. As a way of showing my appreciation, patrons get early access to new games and supplements that I write throughout the course of the year. Huge thanks for watching, it really does help out, and happy gaming.